Well, welcome back to the Lamppost Listener. My name is Daniel. I'm Phil. And this is a podcast where we journey chapter by chapter through C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. This is chapter one of Prince Caspian, The Island. The Island. Yeah, it sounds really serious. The Island. It does. Uh, you know what else sounds serious? What? Our new equipment. Oh, there's a great segue. <laughs> Did you want to talk about it before we jump in? Well, you may notice that our voices are more pleasing baritone. Uh, we're picking up the full range. I don't know. I've still got the same voice, so that's unfortunate for <laughs> listeners. <laughs> no, uh, one thing we're really excited about is we're now in the same room. Yes, and absolutely. we did one of one other episode like this, and it was a lot better, and we're really excited about that. Yeah, we are finally in the same room together. We've got microphones that won't bleed into one another. So, I, I mean, we're just excited for a lot of the new things we're going to be doing this season. And one of the things I am most looking forward to in season two of the show is continuing to build a strong community of Narnian fans. You know, I think we've, we've had listeners on the show before even talk about or a guest on the show, I should say, talk about um, how we, we really think in some ways these are kind of uh, the underdog fantasy, you know, stories in a lot of ways. There's always there's always the comparison to Lord of the Rings and all these other things. Um, but one of the things I have most enjoyed, and I did enjoy so much in doing season one of the show, was building a strong community and seeing how many people out there really do love Narnia. I think it's, it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. I mean, that's one of the reasons that you and I've wanted to have guests on the show, even if they're just our friends, is just to have more people dialoguing about this great fantasy series. I mean, I'd love it. I'm so glad it's just you and me today. I really enjoy these episodes. But, you know, one of the reasons I like having the guests is to hear other people's opinions. I mean, I think everyone. I think there's only been two people that even shared in last season that their favorite books were the same. Like so many people have different favorites and it's just so fun to hear so many different people talk. So I'm excited. We've got some guests lined up for this season. Um, some new, so we're gonna have some new voices, a couple returning voices um, just to add to this conversation. And I guess this is also <laughs> a good time to plug the listeners. Like we, we really do enjoy hearing from y'all. It is a really important part of the show for us. We've enjoyed incorporating listener feedback. And it's even part of the way that, you know, we don't just talk to the one listener and say, you know, listener, like we are addressing our listeners as a whole because we want this to be a community. And so thank you just at, up front for the listeners who have reached out and who continue to reach out. And again, we are just so excited to join in uh, together and grow this community in season two. That was a long intro <laughs> to yeah, get into this. Well said. Uh, to get into this show, um, but here we go. We've got Prince Caspian for the next season. Uh, this book was published in 1951, just a single year after *The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe*. Um, some people, not us, uh, maybe by the end of the season, some people think that it feels really rushed. And actually, it's often been. Yeah, you know, I've heard a lot of people say this is their least favorite book in the series. Maybe that's because, you know, I, I don't know. I honestly, I don't feel that same way. One of the things, Phil, I'm excited to do is go through this season and and kind of look at some of the reasons people might not not like this as much. I mean, how do you feel about it? Well, I'm one chapter in. <laughs> That's true. I but forgot. so far, really good. It is a different pace. It is. It's, it's a it. completely different pace, but it's a different book. I mean, I think one of the things that I really enjoy about Prince Caspian is that it is not the sequel that you would expect. Right. And And for some people, not going to like that. For others, they might really like that. It's could we say it's maybe the last Jedi of oh, the man. Chronicles of Narnia? <laughs> no, no, Bringing going. back all the all yeah. the hits from uh, season one. Yeah, I know. Well, that'll just. I do feel like C.S. Lewis <laughs> is going further up and further in. You don't still don't know what that means. Know that means. <laughs> should we? Should you remind listeners your um, relationship to these books? Yes, I have had a few of these books read to me as a child, but I have not read them as an adult. I read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe twice in preparation for um, season one of this podcast, and I'm now doing the same thing for Prince Caspian. And by twice, I mean I read the same chapter two times in a row, yeah. and yes, that counts. That's fine. Yeah, I'll count, I'll, I'll count that. Fine, it counts. I, I would just count it as once, but we won't have to argue. We can argue off air. <laughs> um, You're trying to get the last word in. It yeah, counts. I'll stop. You know, one of the things I'm also really excited to do is look at different themes as they occur through this story. You know, we did that with The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, and we talked about the idea of the supposal, and we looked at the different tones that each chapter took. I'm really excited to continue doing that through Prince Caspian. And actually, we can start off by looking for a certain theme because C.S. Lewis had something to say about this. Can I share with, share with you some of his words? Please share. So in 1961, a, a young girl wrote to C.S. Lewis. Her name was Anne Jenkins. And she wrote to him uh, with a couple, like she just reached out with a couple, I think, questions about the Chronicles of Narnia. And in that letter, they were talking about a couple of the different books. But 
there's one important thing he said, which is relevant to us here in Prince Caspian. And he actually explained the story of Prince Caspian in his own words, that it tells the restoration of the true religion after the corruption. So right there from the man himself, we have, we, that's the theme of the book. Got it. Yeah. So I guess, yeah. I mean, did you pick up on any of that in chapter one? <laughs> Not in chapter one, but I do like hearing stuff like that, having a big overarching yeah. theme to then go in and then you're viewing everything through that lens. I mean, I think it's kind of cool to take that lens and saying, you know, this is his interpretation. We might feel differently. We're readers, right? Uh, we're not the with the author of this text. But I, I, it's something I want us to periodically look at as we go through this, you know, chapter by chapter and see, you know, when we see that idea start to form. Because I'm not really seeing any of it here in the first chapter, but we're just a couple pages in. So before we do our chapter summary, I guess we should remind people where we were, where we, where we ended the last book, right? Yes. So the Pevensies returned to our world after spending about 15 years as kings and queens of Narnia. So they returned there, and now here we are with our chapter summary. Here we go. One year after their return from Narnia, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy are heading back to boarding school. At a train station, they are pulled back into Narnia into the middle of a dense wood. They make their way out to a beautiful sandy beach and spend time playing in the water. After traveling down the coast looking for food, the Pevensies realize that they are actually on an island. They soon find a fresh stream and begin searching in the woods for food to eat. Lucy is the first to spot an overgrown apple orchard, and as the children continue to explore, they find a stone wall in the middle of the orchard. So a wall in the middle of an apple orchard. Is this confusing at all to you? I know a little bit. A little bit, but not much more. But I do kind of wonder where the orchard part came from. Because okay. I don't remember that from the first uh, book. Yeah, so we, we won't go any further. A lot, some of that's covered in chapter two. Is there anything that really stands out to you here in this chapter? Like, the, what, what really stands out to you? Yeah. They go back into Narnia so fast. <laughs> and look at, the, look at the way it's set up. Yeah. They're there. They kind of miss Narnia. And then they're getting pulled back. Yeah. And we haven't even covered two pages yeah total. it's really really quickly we're yeah. not wasting time at all it do you think do you enjoy that or do you think it feels a little rushed do you really want to hear about <laughs> their lives in england i guess not really no so you're yeah. just like yeah i just want the adventure part i don't care about them being I, in school i really like the narnia part that okay that is way better than like oh here's what life was like in 1940 whatever yeah you know depending on what time so this so was you, the last one in 41, so this would now be in 42? I would assume so, yeah. Okay. That's um, kind of what I was thinking. So, so you're all on board with like, the, I don't really care about them in our world. I just, let's just go right back into Narnia. It's not that I don't care. It's I'm way more excited about... The adventure aspect. Okay, yeah. I mean, that's fair. And so See, I, I kind of like that. He's like, okay, we're going right back in. There are a few movies. Um, I don't... Th have you seen the Rocky movies? No, I haven't actually. I know that's embarrassing. Wow. Okay, <laughs> I don't know how to handle that information, but... <laughs> No, so um, Rocky 1 ends, and Rocky 2 picks up two seconds later. Really? And it's really exciting, because you're like, here we go. Okay. Now we're going back into it. And that's kind of how I felt with this. It's like, wow, we are going right back into Narnia. We don't even have to go through a wardrobe this time. No. Because you can't go name. back the same way that you went in the first time. Yeah, I see. I don't know if I feel quite the same way as you. I am excited that they go back. I think it feels a little rushed, and I'd actually like to hear a little bit more about their time in our world like i really really like um how the lion the witch and the wardrobe we're not fully in narnia till chapter six so we spend almost a third of the book going back and forth a little bit and in this we're like you know a page in and here you are you're in narnia and maybe and it you know i don't i'm not saying i want the same thing that i just read that's not what i want at all but I, i'm always a little bit more interested just to hear of their lives back in our world and we don't really get any of that in this even i'm not trying to move ahead too much to the end of the book but I mean, it, it's all in Narnia. It's you know mostly all in Narnia. Right. So one thing I do notice about the real world versions of these kids is that they have applied everything they learned kind of growing up and maturing. Yeah. And it shows in their dialogue. And C.S. Lewis does an incredible job with that dialogue because it's the same characters. You can tell who Edmund is. You can mm -hmm. tell who Peter is. But now Edmund sounds a little bit more like Peter and... You see later on in the chapter when they're sharing a coat. Is that this chapter? Yeah, I think it's, it's kind of running together. Yeah, we, we prepped a little bit ahead. Um, you see the way they're sharing a coat, and you see see the way Lucy's 
talking. Sure. Su- uh, Lucy says the word presently. Like, I so wonder, just that, is that an island or do we join onto it presently? It's like, she's talking a little bit above. That makes sense. Yeah. Sure it totally up, yeah. makes sense. I mean, the, my biggest thing, before we jump into the text, my biggest standout was I thought there's a theme of discovery and wonder. And even though this is a sequel and we're going back again, it feels so fresh and so new. Like, it, it's not like, oh, here, here we go again kind of thing. It's more like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're back. Like, and so I, that, that was the thing that stuck out to me the most is it doesn't feel boring that we're back. It feels just as exciting as the first time. And it's so, I mean, we couldn't be more, well, I'm getting ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to this first paragraph. I have missed C.S. Lewis's words. So I'm going to go ahead and read the very first paragraph of chapter one. Once there were four children whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. And it has been told in another book called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, how they had a remarkable adventure. They had opened the door of a magic wardrobe and found themselves in a quite different world from ours. And in that different world, they had become kings and queens in a country called Narnia. While they were in Narnia, they seemed to reign for years and years. But when they came back through the door and found themselves in England again, it all seemed to have taken no time at all. At any rate, no one noticed that they had ever been away, and they had never told anyone except one very wise grown-up. Named C.S. Lewis. <laughs> you think they told him? No. <laughs> So you still, because we, we, I know we can't get into too much. You still are thinking that maybe C.S. Lewis is actually the professor that he's written himself in, or I think there is some parallels that we cannot okay. ignore. Okay, okay, that's I'm, I can't wait till we. He's suspect number one. Okay, I I can't say anything else. I know listeners probably really enjoy. He's probably driving the nuts. Yeah. <laughs> based on, based no, on the expression. It's, it's, no, like in a good way. Yeah, I think it's really fun to hear someone reading these books as an adult, and you're still like, there's some mysterious elements that maybe kids wouldn't pick up on as much, but you're trying to, you know that there's some dots you need to connect, but you really have no idea where to connect them at. So I, I think it's really fun. I, man, I really, really just missed C.S. Lewis's voice. It was fun covering the movies and the BBC adaptation, but I have missed hearing C. or, you know, I've, I've missed reading C.S. Lewis's words. An example, I think, is when they say, the first part of the journey when they were all together always seemed to be a part of the holidays. That's a great way to describe it. Because certain things do feel like they're, part of the longer holiday yeah and just the, the whole idea of going back to school i think we all can relate uh even as someone who's in education i love school but there's always the uh it's over and that you know they felt that their term time feelings beginning again and they were all rather gloomy and no one could think of anything to say mm. lucy was going to boarding school for the first time it's a killer and it's sentence. so it's so great he doesn't say lucy's nervous or lucy's overwhelmed or anxious he just says she's going for the first time and we all know i've never been to boarding school but i know exactly the <laughs> what um, like. the feel <laughs> yeah uh no but you you know what feeling he's conveying and yeah. he doesn't do it by telling you it's Man, I love yeah. C.S. Lewis. He states a fact and tells a story. Yeah. And, but just like that, I mean, the uh, one paragraph later, you know, bam, they're in Narnia. <laughs> you know, they're in the middle of this wood. And oh, let me go ahead and just read it because why not hear it? Next moment, the luggage, the seat, the platform, and the station had completely vanished. The four children, holding hands and panting, found themselves standing in a woody place. Such a woody place that branches were sticking into them and there was hardly room to move. They all rubbed their eyes and took a deep breath. Oh, Peter, exclaimed Lucy. Do you think we can possibly have got back to Narnia? It might be anywhere, said Peter. I can't see a yard in all these trees. Let's try to get into the open, if, if there is any open. With some difficulty and with some strings from nettles and pricks from thorns, they struggled out of the thicket. Then they had another surprise. Everything became much brighter, and after a few steps, they found themselves at the edge of the wood, looking down on a sandy beach. A few yards away, a very calm sea was falling on the sand with such tiny ripples that it made hardly any sound. There was no land in sight and no clouds in the sky. The sun was about where it ought to be at ten o'clock in the morning, and the sea was a dazzling blue. They stood sniffing in the sea smell. What a juxtaposition from their first entry uh, through the wardrobe. It literally couldn't be more different. Probably global warming. (laughs) You think that's what's happening here? Narnia, those... The whole thing's underwater. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, it's it's really, really cool because right from the start of our entry into Narnia, we know this is not just, uh, you know, whether you li- you know whether this book is something you really enjoy or something that you feel like is one of the weaker entries in this series, you can't say that it is a carbon copy of the last book at all. It no. is very, very different. And from the get-go, we're seeing that this is not the same story that we just had. 
even with the location, like C.S. Lewis is is showing us that. I love when stories, especially for sequels, when they they know what worked in the previous one, but they don't try to copy the previous work. Okay. They take elements from it because that's what people want, but they also do something completely different. Mm-hmm. So the way they go back is pretty different. Like there's no wardrobe; they're just like kind of transported back. It feels like they're getting pulled. That's a brand new description for us. But they're also getting like poked in the side by branches, which kind of echoes what happened when Lucy was going in for the first time. It's like you're walking backwards and then all of a sudden there are trees and everything. You know, and when they come out of that wood, I love the character beats we get, just like you were talking about them being more mature, which in some ways isn't quite as fun because Susan is being more practical and sensible than she was even in the last book. I mean, she's like, you know, the... She's like, we're going to want to have something to eat before long after they've played in the, the ocean for a little bit. And we're, I think... We're going to need our socks. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's great. But when you're a kid in a magical land, that's kind of a buzzkill. Yeah. Like, we, you need someone who's be, who's thinking about logistics and practicality, but it's just not fun when you're in this magical land and someone's like, well, guys, actually, we're going to need this stuff. It's just not as fun. On the other hand, I feel like the older I get, the more I relate to Susan's character in this chapter. Where okay. it's like, okay... I. I bike to work and I now look at the weather because I'm like, if I get rained on, it's not that I'd mind getting rained on. I mind sitting for eight hours in an office with wet clothes and like wet socks. So I took like, yeah, you don't want to forget your socks. You want them to be dry. Maybe bring a backup pair. You know, it's interesting because as we move on and Susan is being practical and the kids are playing in the ocean, but then they like realize, oh, we don't have food. I mean, they only play. It just says, you know, five minutes later, everyone was barefooted and waiting in the cool, clear water and they're playing and they're doing all this other stuff. But Edmund like, well, oh, we're going to have to have lunch in a little bit. And, you know, Peter's like, well, this isn't actually going to be that fun because we only have two lunches between the four of us. I mean, it is very clear that these are not the same four kids that we've found at the beginning of the line, the witch in the wardrobe. I mean, they're thinking ahead more so than most, you know, preteens and children would really be thinking like, they'd be like, Oh my gosh, we're back in this magical land. Let's just go play forever. And they do a little bit of that. They still have that childlike quality, but it's not forever. They it's do it for forever. a little bit. And then it's like, okay, now to practicality. Yeah. I mean, th- there's, they're, they're quick to jump to creating a plan um, over just exploring and enjoying their surroundings. They, they do still have that because they are children But they're these weird characters, which I'm really excited to see how C.S. Lewis walks through this. Because we have children who were adults, but are still kind of also children. And as we the story unravels, we realize the way that they handle their memories of being kings and queens is not like just like you and I would have memories of us being kids, or just what you know life was like ten years ago. Or for them, they were Narnia just a little over a year ago. They're the way that that memory has sat in their heads is something I'm really interesting. I'm I'm really interested to uncover because it doesn't. There's like this weird nostalgic aspect of it, especially that we see in chapter two. That almost is like it's got this dreamlike quality to it. So I, I'm really interested to see how that makes their characters develop as kids who were adults but are still kids. I wonder what's it like to have forty plus years of memories in your head when you're like 10, 12 years old. Yeah. Anything else that stands out to you just kind of as they're exploring? Because really a lot of this chapter is them just exploring what they soon find out is an island as they kind of travel up the beach. What else stood out to you? I noticed they spent some time looking for shrimps and crabs, but then they wanted to go find something to eat. And I wonder if one of them has a shellfish allergy. You think, <laughs> like, I, I just felt like that's probably not super substantial to yeah. them. And I, they also probably didn't find any. Yeah. Because it, it's not mentioned that they find any. Um, I also thought it was cool how Edmund says it's like being shipwrecked. Yeah. In the books, they always find springs of clear, fresh water. When I was a kid, my impression of old literature, meaning anything before 1990. <laughs> my you just impre- like insulted half of our listeners. <laughs> when I was a kid, <laughs> my impression. No, so when I, when I was younger, I you had the great illustrated classics. And it oh, seemed yeah, like there yeah. were a lot of shipwrecks. Gulliver. Yeah, I mean, I can, you want me to name them? Yeah, like, <laughs> like, I was actually curious. What books do you think of when you read that? Funny enough, I actually, think, when I hear the word, I think of like Robinson Crusoe. Okay. Um, but I actually, when I hear the word shipwrecked, I think of Treasure Island. Okay. Which is interesting because there's not a shipwreck. I think in Treasure Island, I can't remember the name of the ship actually, but there's no shipwreck in it. The ship stays intact the entire time. Uh, oh, the Hispaniola, I think is what it is. But 
I don't know. I just, I think Treasure Island to me kind of is the pinnacle of like swashbuckling literature. Okay. And so when I hear shipwreck, that's what I go to, even though the Hispaniola the stays in, part. Yeah, the Hispaniola yeah. stays intact for the entire book. But that, I mean, that's what I think of. Okay. I think of, uh, so there's, there's the Swiss family Robinson. Sure. There's Robinson Crusoe too. Yeah. I get those two mixed up. It's like the Swiss family Robinson Crusoe. It all kind of blends together for me. Well, Swiss Family Robinson is the family that crashes. They shipwreck, mm -hmm. and then they kind of live on the island. And I think Robinson Crusoe. I've actually never read it. I think it's about. I think it's again a shipwreck, and then Robinson Crusoe spends like thirty years or something on some tropical island. But wow. yeah, played I, by Tom Hanks. So it's a book. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a volleyball named Wilson. So all these stories are from before 1942, right? That you and I just named? Yeah, we're talking, okay. I mean, we're talking, I think Robinson Crusoe is 18th century, so like maybe like 1720s or 30s, and uh, Treasure Island, I think, is 19th century. Okay. I'm not sure, though. I'm just, I'm curious, like, what books is maybe, and it sounds like we're on the same page. I mean, I think they would have been part of, I mean, you know, the Pevensies live in our, I mean, it's called our world. So this is not some other different, you know, when they're in England, they're in our version of England. Like World War II still happens. It's not some weird world that's similar to ours, but maybe not all the same historical things happen. I think we're to believe that this is the same 1940s England that we had. Oh, I agree. I just okay, yeah, was yeah. curious like what those books would be. I wanted to make sure I had well, Yeah, I, j I think that they, those books would have still been a part of kind of the, the national canon, right? That, you know, Edmund would have read growing up. So I think he's pulling from the same things that we are. So as they make it to the stream, this is where I thought the theme of discovery and wonder really kind of came out to me. There's a part where, you know, the others shout, a stream, a stream, and, and tired as they were, they lost no time in clattering down the rocks and racing to the fresh water. And, and you know, as they're kind of making their way up the coast here and they're looking for this water, there I just get the sense that they are just as excited to be back as they first were when they walked into Narnia. Maybe even more so because they know what Narnia is. Like, it's not even explicitly stated. I don't think any of them at this point have said, oh, we are in Narnia. But it's still, like, something that they just are so excited to be back. And I, I feel that as a reader. I feel like that kind of that, uh, that energy and that joy is contagious to me as I'm reading the text. They're also more re relaxed. Because okay. they know that... It doesn't matter how long we stay here. It's going to be a split second and it's not going to affect anything. And so it's kind of like a built-in delay to going back to school too. <laughs> you think that's why they're really excited they don't have to go back to but school? No, I, I think they're they're not dealing with like, oh, we got to get back because I yeah. have that exam. They don't, they're not worried about that. It doesn't even cross their mind because they, they kind of, they've been through this whole routine before. Yeah. Did you, by the way, did you have the illustration of them on the, like actually on the island, kind of climbing up on this tiny little cliff? Yes. That is, yes. I think that is my favorite Pauline Baines illustration in the, in the entire series. Is it because you can see where things are? Uh, yes, yeah, so I guess that's a part of it. I get a little bit of the geography. No, but actually, to be honest, that is, that is part of it. A lot of Pauline Baines' illustrations, and listeners, by the way, I will put this in the show's description. Um, a lot of her illustrations are of characters or they're kind of uh, almost like vignettes, you know what I mean, of different scenes. We actually very rarely get to see the landscape of Narnia. This is the, one of the few times where like the characters are definitely secondary. Like you see all four Pevensies. It looks like Susan's helping Lucy up on the cliff. You know, Edmund or Peter, one of them has, you know, it looks like they're reaching out, just looking down this uh, what looks to be a little river. I'm sure it's the stream as it just got wider uh, near its mouth. But what stands out to me is, especially if you're looking at this illustration in color, it just it's it's beautiful, it's vibrant, and Narnia is kind of quote unquote the main character in the illustration, not any of our actual characters. It's it's uh, yeah, like I said, I think it's my favorite of all of the things we've come across so far. Yeah, that is fantastic. Yeah. So then, as the kids make their way up, that Lucy discovers a well. Let me just go ahead and read it. So then as the kids continue exploring, um, they continue to follow the stream, and this is what C.S. Lewis writes. So they all got up and began to follow the stream. It was very hard work. They had to stoop under branches and climb over branches, and they blundered through great masses of stuff like rhododendrons and tore their clothes and got their feet wet in the stream. 
And still there was no noise at all except the noise of the stream and the noises they were making themselves. They were beginning to get very tired of it when they noticed a delicious smell, and then a flash of bright color high above them at the top of the ripe bank. I say, exclaimed Lucy, I do believe that's an apple tree. It was. <laughs> I love C.S. Lewis's two word sense after that. It was. You know, it sounds like the narrator in Arrested Development. I can hear like Ron Howard saying that. I, and I love this. It's it's the description of Narnia. It's just, it really is just making me so excited to be back. And it reminds me of how, when Narnia turns from winter to spring and the in the previous book and just seeing things like we talk, hear about the fl- the rhododendrons, we see, hear about the apple and just seeing this, the same excitement that Lucy has is what I feel as well too. One thing I love is uh, when the children will say something and then kind of question, like, wait, what does that actually mean? Because it's something they've probably heard before. So an example of that would be Edmund says, look here, there's only one thing to be done. We must explore the wood. Hermits and knights errant and people like that always manage to live somehow if they're in a forest. They find roots and berries and things. And then Susan says, what sort of roots? (laughs) And then... um, Lucy responds, I always thought it meant the roots of trees. And I'm curious about that too. What does that mean? Like like root vegetables or? Well, have you ever heard of a carrot? A carrot? So they're eating, a, <laughs> that's a root? I'm eating a root when I eat a carrot? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's part of the So I think, I, think they're, I don't think they're talking about tree roots. I think they're talking about vegetable roots that would be edible. I don't think they're just gnawing on some, <laughs> you know, wood. I got you. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what they're talking about. So do you want to go ahead and read that last part uh, to the end of the chapter? Sure. And what's that, said Lucy, pointing ahead. By Jove, it's a wall, said Peter. An old stone wall. Pressing their way between the laden branches, they reached the wall. It was very old and broken down in places, with moss and wallflowers growing on it. But it was higher than all but the tallest trees. And when they came quite close to it, they found a great arch, which must have had a gate in it, but was now almost filled up with the largest of all the apple trees. They had to break some of the branches to get past, and when they had done so, they all blinked, because the daylight became suddenly much brighter. They found themselves in a wide open place, with walls all around it. In here there were no trees, only level grass and daisies, and ivy and gray walls. It was a bright, secret, quiet place, and rather sad, And all four stepped out into the middle of it, glad to be able to straighten their backs and move their limbs freely. You know, one of the things that I am just now picking up on as you and I read this together, this is a really quiet chapter. Like that word appears a couple of times. And even though it's it's our, you know, our our main characters entrance, they're kings and queens. They've come back into Narnia. It's, there's no fanfare. There's no, you know, like there's no, you know, rousing, you know, choir, kind of like, oh, you know, like they there's just, they no come. No trumpets, no cymbals, yeah. no <laughs> celebration dinner, no dancing. There's, they just, they come back in the middle of the wood and nobody's there. Even at their happiest point, they're quietly playing on the beach. Yeah. By themselves. What a, what an interesting way, because think, think about other, you know, movies, books, TV show. Like when you come back for, you know, a, a TV show with season two, or you come back with a movie sequel or a book sequel, a lot of times it starts out with a bang to get like, yes, this is what you were missing. It's back. And and here, and we get a tiny bit of that in the you know journey right back to Narnia, but it really just happens super quickly. And then for the rest of it, uh, they don't come back in the middle of some big battle or fight. It's like, there's no, there's not even any conflict. The kids are literally just having a good time. It's really interesting to me. That's just that's very different, I think, than the way that most sequels start off. Definitely. And I, I think in some ways, Lewis is trusting his readers that, you know what we really missed? More than the the characters, more than the you know, the plot. And like we missed Narnia. We missed this place. And that is really the 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 main focus of this chapter is here it is guys y- you missed it narnia's back but it does have this weird like asterisk next to it which is like but it's, it's different it's different it's yeah. it's weird it's it's unknown what is this place and again i don't believe and listeners can correct me if i'm wrong i don't believe they ever acknowledge that it actually is narnia yeah we have suspicions like lucy says is it possible we're back and it's kind of uh brushed aside for a little bit yeah, I mean, Peter's like, it could be anywhere, which I have to wonder, where did, where else could it be? You magically got there. Hey, 
after going to Narnia through guess, a wardrobe, yeah. you're just ready for anything. I guess that's true. Yeah. Yeah. But I do love how it's it's Narnia, maybe. It's different though. And then also here's this castle. And you're like, what? Well, do you even know it's a castle? We just well, I guess we know it's it's some kind of fortress. Yeah. Let's look at the description. Okay. Okay. It's just a wall, an old stone wall. So it's not described as a fortress yet. I'm getting slightly ahead of myself. Yeah. I did do a quick search on my Kindle. It Nar- Yeah, they don't say that it's in Narnia except for that first line where Lucy says, could we have gotten back to Narnia? So this is a really, you know, this is a really weird way to open up a sequel. And I, I don't mean weird in a, a pejorative way, but like it's it's unique. And I, I really like that. Me too. Do you have any last thoughts on this chapter? I have a question. So I, I did remember a few things from reading this before. Okay. But when you were reading this, to other people. Have you done that? Have you read this book in particular? I read this once to uh, one of my classes, yeah. Did they pick up on what was happening in the first chapter, or did it take it being explained in chapter two? Like, did they know that we'd return to Narnia, do you mean? Did they know exactly where they were in Narnia? Oh, no, absolutely no idea. Okay. No. Uh, which I guess we'll talk about more in chapter two. Yeah. All right, well, speaking of chapter two, um, yeah. we will be back next time with chapter two, The Ancient Treasure House. And in that chapter, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy discover familiar ruins. Well, you can follow us into Narnia on our Twitter or Facebook pages. If you have any feedback, you can email us at the Narnia Podcast at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 406-646-6733. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this new book or our show in general. We'd also appreciate a review on Apple Podcasts because this helps other listeners find the show and join with us on our read-through. Also, make sure you subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app so that you can wake up to a new episode every other Wednesday. Our show's themes were created by Kevin McLeod, and you can find more of his work in the links in the episode's description. Thank you for coming along on this journey, and we will be back next time for Chapter 2.